down to welcome all of you here to the Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses. We have in store this afternoon a very interesting Bible lecture. The subject of, the, of this discussion is how important is life to you? You've undoubtedly thought about this subject of life quite frequently. It's an outstanding topic, one that is of interest to each and every human. So we want to pay keen and close attention to the discussion of this subject. We're indeed privileged to have with us this afternoon a representative of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. In fact, this minister is one of the oldest ministers of Jehovah's Witnesses of the modern day. We're indeed glad to have him with us. He has chosen this subject to speak to you and we're going to pay keen and close attention to him. Now I'd like to present to you Mr. A.H. McMillan. Even though life is beset with many difficulties and problems and sorrows, yet men love life. There's an old adage that says, self-preservation or the preservation of life is one of the first laws of nature. Animals will do that. They'll fight to defend themselves and their offspring. And mankind is just like that. Some men will work diligently night and day to amass material wealth. Sometimes they'll sacrifice the, their health and neglect their families in order that they may grow rich. Then when they've accumulated a great fortune, if they find that health is gone and life is ebbing away, they are perfectly willing to give up the fortune or the major portion of it at least to get their health back again. There's a story told about uh, one of our noted millionaires. You all remember him. He was a Pennsylvanian by business, if not by birth. Andrew Carnegie. In the steel business in and around Pittsburgh, he made countless millions. They named a city after him. And after he accumulated his great wealth, the problem came, how am I going to give it away and get rid of it? So he began building libraries for the people to get an education. He moved to New York and had a very beautiful home in the aristocratic part of the city. And the custom was, on each birthday, representatives of the principal papers of New York would gather at Mr. Carnegie's home and uh, ask him some questions and get some advice or counsel for the people of New York City. On his 82nd birthday, the story goes, when these newspaper representatives appeared in his presence, he said, gentlemen, I have a proposition to make to you, any one of you that will guarantee me 10 more years of life with as much health and strength as I have now, he will get 10 millions of dollars that I have set aside for that purpose. Not one of the men came forward to accept the offer. Why? Because they could not guarantee life even for themselves, much less for anybody else. But Mr. Carnegie was willing to pay one million dollars a year for life in his 80s, but he couldn't buy it. The psalmist of old said, the 49th Psalm, no man can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. There's another verse connected with that that says some trust in their riches and their great wealth that's the preceding verse to what I quoted. But they, that wealth does not secure for them health nor life. Moreover, God is the fountain of life, and from him, from him alone, life comes. Well, now life has been cheapened on the earth by cruel, merciless, selfish rulers. Many of them would drill a great army declare war against a neighbor in order to increase their commercial interests and add to their territory, to their empire. What do they care about the sacrificing 
of the lives of tens of thousands of men, ordinary men, which they call us people, as long as they could advance their own selfish interests. Then again, we have another matter that cheapens life. Some of you may remember some years ago we had down in New York City a group of men that called themselves Murder Incorporated. If any, na any man in New York or anywhere else had an enemy he wanted to get rid of, contact someone representing Murder Incorporated and pay a certain fee, the man is wiped out and you never get in any trouble about it. So they claim. Then we notice in these modern days that young men in their teens will murder their buddies, their sweethearts, and sometimes their parents for just a very insignificant or trivial matter. Another consideration is the false views that many religions hold concerning mankind and his future. Some, you know, claim that we only live here a short period of time and we pass on into a new and different world. And if you behaved yourself while you were here, you might be a more important person over there. On the other hand, if you did not behave, you might be a dog or a cat or a rat or a mouse. And others say, well, you go into the new world or another world beyond and you become part of the deity and your descendants on earth will worship you. That's what is termed ancestor worship. So these ideas confuse people and they wonder about it. Men, however, are deeply interested in the present life. They know what this life is worth and they desire to have part in it and to enjoy their lives and they'd like to live longer if they possibly could, as in the case of the multimillionaire I mentioned a moment ago. Now you may search the sacred writings of the different prominent or religions of the world, and you will not find one of them that contains any satisfactory outline of human history and why God created the earth and put man upon it. The Jews have their Talmud, and there's a great many things written there, but it is not satisfactory. And then others have what they call the Koran, we have in this country a great variety of them, the Book of Mormon, and Science and Health, and other different sacred writings that are held before us as offering a solution for the problems of life. Why did God create this earth? What was his purpose? Why did he put man upon it? And what does life amount to anyway? Some have come forward with the strange idea of course, they wouldn't like the way I'm going to state it, but nevertheless, it states the facts as they believe them in perhaps you might call a little crude language. Some believe this earth was created to be a breeding place until heaven and hell are filled. Then the world will be burned up and that will end it. So that's a rather a strange outlook, isn't it? The Bible and the Bible alone gives an accurate history of God's purpose in creating the earth and man upon it. And it shows the history of man and its final conclusion. And the conclusion is satisfactory to the great creator. Now the first two chapters of Genesis tell us about the creation of the earth. The first few words of the Bible are you know are these. In the beginning God created and it goes on. Now that statement in the beginning there is a comprehensive one. I read uh, what a noted commentator had to say about that that lived many years ago and spoke seven or eight languages, could almost repeat the Bible from memory from one end to the other, and he said those words are so dis instructive, so comprehensive, that no man would ever have put them together. They are of divine origin. And that's what the Bible claims. But God revealed these matters to man in the beginning concerning his creation and its purpose. So the first two chapters of Genesis tell us why the our Lord created the earth, what his purpose was. Then we get into the third chapter of Genesis and it tells us about the tragedy, 
that brought sorrow and death upon the human family. But however, when the Lord sentenced the three criminals, Adam, Eve, and the devil represented by the serpent, he didn't leave them hopeless. You remember he made a rather strange statement there in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. He said, the seed of the woman will bruise the serpent's head. Now we couldn't get much out of that today if we didn't know something about the history of man as recorded in the Bible. The serpent represented Satan. The woman, evidently, they thought was Eve. And the bruising of his head would indicate his destruction. And evidently Eve had that thought in her mind. When Cain was born, the first child, she said, I have received or gotten a man from the Lord. She evidently thought Cain was the one referred to there, but she was disappointed. Cain turned out to be a murderer, and his progeny is not mentioned beyond a few generations in the Bible. Now, the last few verses of the Bible, last few chapters, I should have said, beginning with the 20th, it tells us about God removing the enemy that brought the trouble upon the world. Then it goes on to show definitely and positively that the purpose of Jehovah, as recorded in the beginning, was fulfilled to the eminent satisfaction of his infinite wisdom. So now to the Bible we go to learn something about how important life really is. Now what does the Bible, what does the Bible tell us about man's original estate. Well, it shows there, the second chapter, that he was in a beautiful garden park. Mark you, the Almighty God prepared that garden. We see some lovely gardens today. I drove out around calling some people amongst the hills here in the valleys of your country, and I thought the landscape looked most beautiful. Green grass, wheat, grains growing, flowers around the home. They were very beautiful to watch. But imagine, they're the product of man's effort. But when the Lord God, one infinite in wisdom and almighty in power, prepared a garden, it certainly must have been beautiful. It says every tree was pleasant to look at. Well, all trees, healthful state, are nice to look at. But these that God created were perfect. And there were fruits there that were desirable. And everything that man could wish for in that beautiful garden home. Then man had fellowship with God. God talked to him, communicated with him, and he had life, fullness of life. He had no aches nor pains. He had no worries or troubles. Man was in a perfect condition of happiness in a beautiful home and sweet fellowship with his creator. Now, what brought his troubles about? Well, his troubles came simply by disobeying God's laws. Just one simple law. The Lord didn't give him a long list of you shall not and you must and you must not and so on. Just one little thing. But that involved a lot. If you touch or go near a certain tree, you will forfeit your life. Now I doubt it if that uh, prohibition would have continued indefinitely, but it did. For, it was for a time. Well, Adam and Eve ignored the proposition disobeyed God. Now, what did they bring upon themselves? Now there's the problem that we start with. Some say they were sentenced to eternal torment. Others say, no, it was death. Well, those that believe in eternal torment will admit there's nothing mentioned in the Bible about that. And they do know that it's obnoxious to all intelligent peoples and nations to introduce what they call a post facto law. That is, they cannot make a law to punish a crime after the crime is committed. They must be dealt with according to the laws on the statute books when the crime is committed. Now, when God created man, did he make him part human and part spiritual? A great majority of people say, yes, he did. But the Bible doesn't say that. It's very simple. child can understand it. He made man's form from the dust to the ground. Now, is that true? Yes. Science establishes the fact today that there's not one element in our bodies but what is found about us in the ground. That is a stated fact according to science. Now then, he breathed into 
the nostrils of this perfect form, the breath, and he became alive. If you say it that way, you don't get the whole story. God breathed into the man's nostrils the breath of life. Ah, there's something. Man might make a form out of protoplasm that looked much like a human. He might take a bellows and blow breath in. There's the lungs that he had prepared in his form. There'd be no life. Jehovah God, the fountain of life, breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. Then what happened? Man became a living creature, a sentient being. The eyes there would then begin to see things. It's connected with the visual convolutions of the brain to the optic nerves, the hearing, the ears, connected with the auditory convolutions of the brain, and so on. All the nerves are there ready to go into action. You see, Adam had a peculiar experience. He wasn't born a little baby and then grew up and learned a little day by day till he became fully grown. He was made a full man to begin with. And if someone could have gone to Adam when he learned to talk a little bit and say, Adam, what did you do last year? Last year? This is my third day alive. I had no last year. Beginning life right there. Now, what did God say to him? Did God say, now, Adam, you're a wonderful man. But if you live in harmony with my laws and do what I tell you, you'll die by and by, but I'll take you to heaven. Oh, that's greater than earth. Then you'll be happy. But if you disobey me, oh, Adam, it'll be too bad for you. I've got a place that I made myself. Some say it's in the center of the earth, and the others say they don't know where it is, and I guess they're the right ones. They don't know. Now, it's, it's filled up with enough fuel to last eternity. And if you disobey me, oh, let your body go back to the dust, but you've got something in you that is an immortal part. And I'll take that immortal part and put it down in that fire, and you'll just burn and roast day and night forever and ever. I'll just put you in one little corner. You'll never move from there. You'll have no communication with anybody. You'll have no hope, not a thing but torment, day and night. That was what, that that's what they tell us that God had in store for Adam. Well, you wouldn't do that to a dog, if you try, even if he tried to kill you, nor any other animal. Yes, that's what God was going to do with that soul. Well, now tell us, what is that soul? Where is it located? Well, they say we can't tell you that. But one man did attempt it. He was a noted bishop of a certain uh, denomination. And here's what he said. Some of you may have read it. He said a soul has no interior or exterior. It has no form and no parts. And you could put a million of them in a nutshell. Well, the man that quoted that, whom I read, said, well, that bishop gave a splendid description of nothing. But that was his idea of the soul. That was added, you see, to what God said. When Adam was created and brought into being, he was made a living, sentient, human creature. And he had a commission given to him. Now, Adam, after his wife was brought to him and created, you two have the power of procreation, something no other creature had. The angels in heaven don't multiply. They were all created, as far as the Bible is concerned, full creatures, independent. One can't say there's my mother and my grandmother and great-grandmother. They were all created. But Adam and Eve were given something they knew nothing about up there. God knew about it. In a power of procreation. Now he said, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. In other words, make the earth as beautiful as I made that garden. And yeah, that's a beautiful place. That was the commission. That was the hope before Adam and Eve. Now just imagine if they had remained faithful to God, what a wonderful future they would have had. As the family would increase, Eden wouldn't be large enough. They were to go outside of Eden, <coughs> develop the land, create homes there, and men like to do that. I happen to call on a home today in the country they went right out in the wilderness where it seems the trees are so close together a rabbit could hardly get between them. Cut down the trees, cleared the spot, built a lovely little cottage home with all modern conveniences and is beautifying the place. And the man is happy and his wife. While in the city, they were under strain and nervous. Men love to do things like that. 
That was God's commission to the first pair. How could you improve on it? Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. Now imagine after a few thousand years, wouldn't Adam be an important fellow? Perfect, yes. There's my great, great, and you wouldn't have enough greats to mention grandfather up there. And all these children would love him. He'd love them. There'd be no troubles, no family quarrels, no gossiping, no backbiting. No, it would have been just as peaceful and lovely on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what Jesus taught us to pray for. The conditions on earth would become like they are in heaven. Now Adam had all that before him. That's mentioned in the Bible. Then the villain appears on the scene. Satan operating through the serpent and tempts this pair. Well, they disobeyed. Now what they brought upon themselves what? What did they really lose because of their act of disobedience? Well, I think you'll all agree they lost that lovely park home. It says they were driven out and they weren't allowed to go back. There were cherubim there with flaming swords that kept the way. They couldn't get back in. So they lost their lovely home. Well, couldn't they start another? Oh, but it would be hard work. The Lord said, Adam, you labor with a sweatier brow. Thorns and thistles the earth will bring forth to you, and it will be a hard job for you. Then they lost their fellowship with God. <clears throat> he no longer communicated with them as his obedient children, but he did place them under the sentence of death. They lost their lives. You're going to die, Adam. Well, people say Adam didn't die that day. The Bible says he did. In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. <clears throat> but hold on a minute now. Genesis 5, 5 says that Adam was 930 years when he, old when he died. That's exactly right. Now who said to him, the day you eat you'll die? God Almighty. What did Peter say about God? With God a day is like a thousand years. And Jehovah told the truth. In other words, within my day, that's a thousand years long, you'll die. And he lived to be 930 years, and no other man lived to be a thousand years. Methuselah is the oldest man recorded in the Bible. He lived to be 969 years. Never got to the full thousand of God's day. So Adam went out, cursed of God, cut off from his home and fellowship with his creator that must have been as dear to him as almost as life itself, to toil and suffering and pain. And it wasn't very long, he had a couple of children and one murdered the other. That was a terrible tragedy and a calamity. How they must have wept over the dead body of that second son. Good boy, boy that believed in God and worshipped him. Cain, the merciless murderer, went on about his business. Then the Bible takes up, you see there, beginning with the third chapter of Genesis all the way through the history of mankind his troubles and sorrows his wars and his attempts to establish peace his fighting against the elements excessive heat severe cold droughts floods pestilence calamities wars the whole history is found there in the Bible not however written in story form you must study it to find that but you can find it if you look then he come, the Bible comes down to the point where Jehovah God then began to open matters up to them a little bit more, give human creatures hope. The Lord Jesus Christ, who was the Son of God, came from heaven down here to the earth, made this statement, Matthew 18, 11. The Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Most evangelists will tell you, oh, he came to save them, those, came to save you. Jesus didn't say that. I came to save that which was lost. Now, what did Adam and Eve lose? Well, we saw in the beginning what they lost, fellowship with God, beautiful home, and life. Now, that's what Jesus came to save for them. Now, the great question is, will he accomplish that purpose? We'll see in the end that that will be done. The last three chapters of the Bible tells us then about the real action that's to take place to bring this desirable and glorious result about. The 20th chapter tells the opening of it, you know, about the binding 
of Satan. That's a good job. That's got to be done first. He was the one that started the trouble. Now get him out of the way and you might begin to improve matters. I thought when I was a young man years ago, living back east and tried to work to help mankind to get out of their troubles and get a heavenly home when they die, I thought if all Christian people would work together and work diligently for one generation or two, we'd have the devil whipped and the world converted. Now that is about 60 years ago. How is the world today? Converted. <laughs> it's worse than ever as far as I can see it. Men try diligently to convert it. They've made it easier all the way down. I remember in the earlier days when the noted Mr. Moody and Sankey and Francis Murphy and Sam Jones and others used to go around holding great revivals. They didn't say, walk down the aisle and say, I'm for Christ and go back about your business and you're saved. No, no. They pointed out things you must do if you're going to get salvation. This is only going to start you. Well, they weren't getting very many that way. And they fell off. And now they got it fixed up in a very easy way. Great orchestra plays. Pathetic songs are sung. The emotions of the people are stirred up and they all won't feel they're floating up in the air. Then they say, will you decide for Christ? And they have men around there. Come on, come on, brother. Come on up. Come on here. And they coax them up and they lead them along. They count them. You're saved. 5,000 or 500. Away they go. Back to their old habits of life. Perhaps clean up for a while. But if you do say that for me here, when you die, an angel will meet you at the pearly gates and lead you down the street of gold and give you a palace of gold. And there you'll dwell forever. Now the apostle Paul was well posted in matters of that kind. He didn't say a thing like that. Paul said that he was willing and did give up everything that was worthwhile in life. He was whipped. They had whips then with 13 lashes and a burr on the end of them. Paul says he got three times whipped and had 40 stripes saved one. That was his way of telling you 39. He was stoned and he was beaten. And he was in the sh uh, shipwreck night and the day in the deep. Hungry, midst dangerous brethren, threatened with wild beasts, all these things, I gladly do it all, that I may win Christ and have life. If he was only living today, all he need to do is be walk down the aisle and get the whole thing. But things have changed, you see. Men have changed the matter a great deal. Well now, when we come to Christ and accept what he has to offer for us, Upon what basis do we get that? Emotion? No. The Bible shows it very clearly then that Adam was a perfect man and the whole race was in him. And Adam committed an act of disobedience. And the Apostle Paul argues in the fifth chapter of Romans, by the disobedience of one man, sin entered the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men. Then in the 15th of 1 Corinthians, he tells us who the, the man was. In Adam, all die. In Christ, they will get a chance for life. Now what was that based on? Sentiment? Deathbed stories? A lot of sentimental music? And a thrilling scene? No, based upon legal matters. Legality. Law. God's law was violated. The man incurred the penalty. He could not get away from that penalty unless it was met. You can't bribe Jehovah God and say, well... Adam was taken by surprise and Eve wanted to uh, get some knowledge she didn't have. And can't you overlook that? No, no. God's laws are absolutely fixed. If they're disobeyed, you're bound to incur the punishment. <clears throat> now then, that curse of death was brought upon, brought upon mankind. The only way that we, the children of Adam, can escape the curse of death that we inherited is by accepting Christ Jesus as our Savior. Now here we go to the Word of God again. The 49th Psalm. Some trust in their riches and their wealth and all that. But that'll never save them. Now here's what the psalmist says. Some men trust in their, wit in their riches, but not one of them 
can give unto God a ransom for him nor redeem his brother. All the money you have. Carnegie offered a million dollars a year for life and couldn't get it. If he had a hundred millions, he couldn't buy life. Life doesn't come that way. They must be redeemed from the curse of death that Jehovah legitimately placed upon them before they can get life. Well now, how did Jesus redeem all of them? He was only one man. There's the economy of God's law. Mark you, we were not sentenced to death. Not one of us. Well, then why are we dying? Oh, we inherit death. Adam was sentenced. Eve was sentenced. They were told they were going to die. But we inherited the curse. We never had any definite trial like Adam and Eve had. No, and God did not sentence the children of Adam to death, but they inherited the curse. And we're under the penalty of the curse. Now, to illustrate what I'm trying to get at, suppose a man is in prison here in jail, going to spend three months there, say, or pay a fine of $5,000. Poor fellow's languishing in jail and he can't raise the 5000 But he has a friend that hears about his predicament. And the friend is ready to pay his penalty. Where does the friend go to do that? Go to the jailer and say, let John Smith out of there, here's $5,000. I've got nothing to do with that. I'm to see that he stays here. Who will I go to? The one that passed the sentence or entered the judgment. Go to the judge, the court. He goes to the court, says, I'm willing to pay this man's fine. Very good. They go to the proper proceedings. The records are made. The man's release is ordered. Then the friend goes down where? To go to the jailer and say, well, now, uh, uh, I'll give you $100 if you let him out. Look at this paper. You don't need a, pe I don't need a penny. Go to the judge. Oh, judge, I'm so thankful that you did that. I'll give you an extra 500 that would be bribing him. You paid the full penalty. Go and get the man out. Now the man gets out of jail. Free man. Does he thank the jailer for that? No. Does he thank the judge for it? No, that judge would have left him in there the whole period of time before he'd let him out. He thanks the man that provided the ransom money, the release. So then, if we get life today, not necessary for us to go to some pious looking fellow with a rubber collar on backwards in a black suit to make us think he's very important and very pious and say now here if you get me out of hell or out of danger of going there I'll give you so and so and so and so so some writers trying to make a joke of that whole thing telling about a very noted doctor and a bishop they're very great friends and the bishop said doctor if you will try and keep me out of heaven, I'll do what I can to keep you out of hell. Well, you say, what was that? It's a crazy statement. No. The bishop was afraid he'd die and go to heaven. The doctor was afraid he'd die and go to hell. The bishop was trying to fix it so that the doctor wouldn't go to hell if the doctor would keep him from, the bishop, from dying and going to heaven. Men have nothing to do with that. Jesus Christ paid the penalty according to Jehovah's arrangement. It's free. We come there and accept it, and we thank God for it. No man is entitled to any praise, honor, or thanks for that. You don't need to have an intermediary, intermediator either. You go on your knees before your God and accept release from what? The condemnation of death. Well, that doesn't make you better, uh, your health any better. You're not restored to you, no, but it does relieve you from the curse of death and gives you the opportunity to dedicate your life to Almighty God and come then in line for everlasting life. There's the point. Jesus paid the penalty, and I'll tell you the penalty was costly. If you're going to consider the value of life for its importance, on the basis of what it cost to get life for us, it would be a great price. Jesus Christ was in heaven with Jehovah God, his only begotten son, with him from the beginning. He left the riches, the honor, the majesty, the glory of heaven, and came down to earth as a man. Oh, he didn't do that someday. He was a God-man. He was the son of God, all right. And God loved him. But he was a human for that purpose. He laid aside his heavenly glory. Read what Paul said in the second chapter of Philippians. 
He emptied himself. Though he was in the form of God, he didn't meditate a usurpation to be like God, but humbled himself, made flesh, became a man. Then he was obedient unto death, even the death of the torture stake. For that God highly exalted him. So then, in order to get release from the curse of death, their penalty must be paid. The Lord Jesus Christ paid that penalty. And as a result, we can get free from the penalty and God will hear us then. And then we're invited by God through his word to come and surrender ourselves to him in full dedication and agree to the best of our ability as guided by the Bible to do God's holy will. If we do that, then life is our portion. Now, in the last three chapters of the Bible I've already mentioned about, it shows the conclusion of this matter, how Jehovah's original purpose relative to the earth and man on it will be completely worked out to his satisfaction. I have already referred to it, but the 20th chapter of Revelation here speaks about the culprit, the enemy, the villain being removed. I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid all of the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. See, he got all of his names there, so you can't mistake who he was. And bound him a thousand years, cast him into the bottomless pit, that he should set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were up. Then he would be loosed for a little season. Now that doesn't end at all. That's only the beginning of the good things. But you say, uh, hold on a minute now. Uh, that'll be all right for those who are alive at that time. How about the poor people that died? Any hope for them? Well, some will say they, uh, they're gone either to heaven or hell and they'll almost die fighting for that lie. That was Satan's lie. Jesus said that is the first lie was ever told. And yet there's lovely men and women, cultured and refined and educated, that would rightly almost give their life in defense of that cursed, damnable lie that Satan told. You're not dead, you're more alive than ever. Now, here we read the 21st chapter of Revelation. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He'll dwell with them, and they'll be his people. What? God going to dwell with the children of Adam and be their friend again and talk with them, have fellowship with God? That's one of the things Adam lost. Jesus said he came to save that. So that God himself will be with them and be their God. Now what will he do for them? And God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. My, my, there have been many tearful eyes on this planet for the past 6,000 years. And he'll wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. You know, it's very difficult to us to conceive a thing of that kind. We were very first thing we learned about when we got out was there such a thing as death. We saw the undertaker's parlor. We saw the, the, the graveyard. And then he says, in addition to that, there'll be no sorrow nor crying. And we cried when we were babies and cried a lot since then. We saw others cry. That all going to stop? How could it be done? God Almighty can do it. Neither shall there be any more pain. Well, that's a great thing to us. You remember the little boys, girls growing up, they'd have tummy aches. They ate something they shouldn't have. They'd have ear aches. And dear only knows what other kind of aches we've all had. But there'd be no more pain. Imagine a world like that. Ah, that's just a fanciful dream, is it? I believe every word that's written in that book, and that's no dream. That's a stated fact. And the power of Almighty God pledges us to us that these things will be carried out. And he says, no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Now do you believe them? If you do, you have a glorious hope set before you 
in the future. If you do not believe them, close the book. Use it as a place to hide poems or a dollar or two you don't want anybody to get for you. Know nobody in the house will ever look there for anything. And that's the way the joke goes. And that the Bible is a book that just collects dust. But if you believe that, you'll say, oh, that's a glorious hope. Well, then, how about the dead? Come back to that. Well, the Bible says that the dead know not anything. They've gone into, the, into death. Inherited that. The difference whether you or I sin or not, we're going into death. We inherit that. Try to tell me that the sweet little tot, a few weeks or months old, that's just a dear child to everybody, even a brute would have love, it seems to me, for a sweet little child like that. Tell me that that child, when it dies, died because it sinned? Preposterous. And yet, Paul said in Romans 5.23, or 6.23, the wages of sin is death. That child is dead. The result of sin, its own sin? No, it didn't commit any sin. It inherited that curse from Adam because an inspired writer of the Bible said, in Adam all die. The little top dies. 6,000 years nearly after Adam sinned. Yes, the curse of death is resting upon the whole world. They're going down into death. As the poet said, the earth is old with centuries, but not for this she bows her head. Close to her heart, the sorrow lies, she holds so many dead. The dead are out of existence. And we have hope for them. Why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ purchased them, died for them. Therefore, he said, the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves will hear his voice because he has authority to utter it. And they'll come forth. Yes, come forth. There are the words of Jesus. John 5, 28 and 29. Those that have done good to the resurrection of life and those that have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Well now, when they come forth, you say, what will they be like? There's where the mystery comes in. Will they, will they be spiritual, spirit creatures with wings, or will they be dwarfs or giants? Well, let us take an illustration. There's a man lived in Bethany of Palestine. His name was Lazarus, a great friend of Jesus. Jesus frequently went there. They took care of him. They were just a small family the brother and two sisters. And it, Jewish uh, tradition says that Lazarus was a well-educated man and a scribe. He did much writing of copying prophecies and other things for the rabbis and the priests. And Lazarus got sick. Jesus was away off in some other part of the country and news came to him that La him whom thou lovest is sick. And Jesus didn't go there to do anything for him. And finally... He said, let us go to where Lazarus is. But, Master, we got word that he's dead. No, no, he's not dead. They laughed at him. Lazarus is asleep. Now, Jesus made a clean-cut difference between sleep and death. We don't have time to go into that, but to say this briefly. If a person is in the sleep of death, in asleep, there's hope of being awakened. But if a person is destroyed eternally in the second death by the power of Almighty God, that's not a sleep, that's a death because, as the prophet says, they are in an eternal condition of death in the congregation of the dead. Peter got up and said, well, Master, if, if Lazarus is asleep, why, why he wake up, he'll be better. No, he won't. He's dead now. That is, he in the sleep of death. So Jesus said, let us go where he is. Now, Jesus didn't go right directly to the house because he knew the Jews were watching for him to get him. They want to get him arrested and get, out of the, get him out of the way. So, word came in to Martha and said, Martha, the master is out there and he wants to see you. So, Martha ran out. Now, you remember what she said to him? Oh, Lord, if you'd only been here, my brother would not have died. Why didn't you come? He loved you. We all loved you. You healed the sick of sinners, others that didn't do a thing for you, and you left us in despair, and my brother's dead. You can imagine her weeping then. The only means of support, a wonderful man. 
And Jesus said to her, Don't worry, Martha, because when Lazarus died, he went right to heaven. He's up there with Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's supreme. Did he say that? Never said a word like that. That's what the preacher would say, though, today. Don't worry about your departed one. They're away with the Lord. Streets of gold. Gates of pearl. Wonderful. What did Jesus say? He said, Martha, your brother's going to rise again. Did she say what? Rise? Where'd that come from? She answered, I know that. Where'd she learn it? From Jesus and the prophets. I know he'll rise in the resurrection at the last day. She wanted him that day. So then you remember how Mary came to the scene. And all the crowd in the house weeping with them came out, followed. Oh, they're going to the grave to weep. It was my privilege some years ago to go into Bethany, and they'll show you around where that was. You can't be sure it was there. But <coughs> the thing looked very much like the Bible tells us. There was a big stone there. looked like one of our big millstones, perhaps four or five feet in diameter and about eight inches thick, and a groove for it to run in. <coughs> and it was there they laid it. They were all standing around, weeping. And we, it says Jesus wept. Now, was he weeping because Lazarus was dead? Couldn't think that. He knew in a few minutes he'd have Lazarus alive and they'd all be supremely happy. I believe Jesus, with prophetic vision, looked from that day down to our day. And he saw every deathbed scene, every funeral, every brokenhearted father or mother or child, and in advance, he wept for them. It says, Jesus wept. Where did you lay him? Oh, Martha said she was a practical woman. Don't go near the grave because his body is decaying by this time. You do what I tell you. So they went, there's the grave, rolled the stone away, and then Jesus prayed. A very pathetic prayer to his Father in heaven. And after he prayed, he turned to the open door there, or passageway into the tomb, and he said, Lazarus, come forth. And we read, he that was dead came out. Well, well, but didn't, didn't he come down from heaven or up from purgatory or some other place? No, it doesn't say that. He said the man that was dead, he came forth. Bound up with death clothes, wrapped around linen in order that they might later embalm the body. He said, loose him and let him go. Did Lazarus spend all of his time then telling what it was like up there in heaven, who he saw there and how grand it is and how sorry he was that Jesus called him back? Never a word about that. Not a word did he ever say. Why? Because God's word said, as found in Ecclesiastes 9.5, the living know a little. And one thing is, he says, the living know they'll die. How much did the dead know? The dead know not anything. So, Lazarus had nothing to say. They made a feast for him the next day. Lazarus was full and healthy. The next day they made a feast for him. And Jesus was there. And many people heard about it and they came from a long distance to talk with Lazarus about heaven or hell or purgatory. No. They came to look at a man that was dead and buried for four days. Lazarus never said a word about it. At least there's nothing ever recorded that he did. Now, the voice that spoke to the dead, the sleeping in death, at Bethany of Palestine said this, and you know it, John 5, 28 and 29. The hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves will hear the voice of the Son of Man come forth. Yes, he has authority and he'll do it. But now, when is that going to be done? Well, now the Bible makes that clear, but it requires some attention and study. The first thing now in the final conclusion of this drama that Jehovah caused to be recorded in the Bible, in its conclusion, the closing chapter where everything is all well, Satan is bound taken out of the way. He not going to interfere with anybody. How many people did he deceive? Revelation 12, 9 tells us he deceived quite a lot. There we read the dragon, the old serpent, called Satan of the devil, who has deceived the whole world. How has he deceived them? He hasn't deceived us much to say, now if you're going to eat, you must provide food. If you get tired, you must rest. And so on. He didn't, really, didn't fool us in that. He fooled us mankind about God. 
He confused them on a religious basis, told them a lie, and he has worked diligently with demons associated, spirit creatures that rebelled with him. They worked for 6,000 years upon human mind to mix us up, and I don't see how they could have been mixed up much worse than they are. Why, in America alone, we have 250 religions, and they're all different, and they all contradict each other, and they're all mixed up. The world takes in thousands of them. A terrible mess. Yes, Satan has deceived the whole world on the matter of religion. But he has not deceived those who come to Jehovah and dedicate themselves to him. For Jesus said he would, if it were possible, deceive the very elect. But he's not able to do that. God protects them. Now this work of the resurrection is not going to be a, such a shock that everybody will run away. Do you reckon that Mary and Martha started running for the woods when they saw Lazarus coming up out of that grave? I don't think they did. I think they ran toward Lazarus and said, thank God he's here. He didn't have the sickness that killed him. No, if Jesus had reached his bedside a minute or two before he died, he would have healed him. That would not have been considered a great miracle. But it, of course it would be one. But now here the man comes out. Oh, you can imagine how happy they all were. What a great day that was. So it'll be a reasonable matter. First, the kingdom is going to be established. And Jesus taught us to pray that his kingdom would come in order that his will might be done in the earth as it is done in heaven. So then, the tabernacle of God is with men. Christ is the king. And he'll wipe away tears from all eyes. There'll be no more death, nor sighing, or crying. Now that'll not all be done at once. The Bible gives it to indicate that there will be a thousand years of Christ's reign. And those who obtain life during that time must first dedicate themselves to Jehovah God. And that's a thing all sensible creatures should do. Some say, oh, if you dedicate yourself to God, you must never smile. You must go along with a long face and you couldn't enjoy a not a rider. You couldn't have a garden and beautiful flowers or a nice home. Oh, you must go around with your head down, get a rubber collar on backwards and a black uh, hat on or a black skirt hanging around and go like an angel of death. That's not the way. Why, Adam and Eve were the happiest pair you could imagine, had everything beautiful. That's the kind of a home God wants his creatures to have. Every tree pleasant to the sight and good for food. Don't have to worry about whether it'll be a good crop that year or not. You'll have everything. So God provides for them. His, he's with men. They're his children. He's looking after them. Now it says a little bit about the conditions in the last chapter of Genesis. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. The water we get around here, whether it's in the spring or whether it's in a reservoir or, or in the city reservoirs got a whole lot of chemicals in there to kind of purify it. But this is the water of life. If we drink enough of the water that have in most cities like we have now in New York, it would soon kill you, it seems to me, the way it tastes full of chlorine and other stuff. But this is the pure water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. And in the midst of the street, on either side of the river, there were trees of life. Trees of life, Mark. There was a tree of life in Eden. God wouldn't let Adam get to that after he sinned because he didn't want him to have everlasting life. But here are trees of life. Go and take all you wish. Now which bear twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. <laughs> no doctor signs there, no drug stores. You had to get the leaves of the trees if you thought you had something wrong with you. Oh, that would cause the healing. Now notice the next verse. And there shall be no more curse. The earth was cursed when Adam and Eve were turned out in it and it was an unproductive soil. And the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him. Now what was God's purpose to creating the earth? What was it anyway? Why well, he said he, he created to be man's home. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Do you think that'll be done? It certainly will. If we had time to go into the prophecy showing that during that thousand years, children will be born. Take Isaiah 65, for instance, where he said, beginning at verse 17, how that new system of things will be grand and glorious. Men will build houses and live in them. 
Well, they do that today, don't they? You take these big $10 million houses. How many mechanics live in the houses like that? They build them. The multimillionaire that never did a day's honest work in his life lives there. The mechanic builds them. One man builds, the other inhabits. One man plants a vineyard, the others eat the fruit they're on. Did you ever hear of a farmer becoming a millionaire just by his at work on the farm? I never did, you may have. Did you ever heard of those that handle the product of his toil becoming millionaires? Oh, there are many of them. They'll plant vineyards and eat the, eat the fruit of them. They'll not one build and another inhabit. They'll not one eat and another enjoy the fruit thereof. And they'll not bring forth children for trouble. No, there'll be no call going out to drill in an army and go off over to China and some other where and be taken prisoner and be put in a rotten jail for months and perhaps die there. No worry about that at all. That boy will not have to go there. There'll be, they'll not learn war anymore. And Isaiah says in chapter 33, not one of them need to say, I am sick. Did anybody ever remain sick where Jesus was? I have never found any record in the Bible that did. Well, a poor man had the leprosy. For they, they, they can't cure that today with all their scientific knowledge. Well, Jesus met, met a bunch of them, ten of them. That quick he healed them all. Could do that today? No power man has can do that. He healed those who had the palsy. Well, how many kinds of disease did he heal anyway? Well, John says... He healed all manner of disease. You can't think of one, neither could I, that he didn't heal. He healed them all. <clears throat> and that's just a picture of what his kingdom work would consist of. The first miracle Jesus ever performed was in Cain of Galilee at a wedding. It says there in the second chapter of John, This beginning of miracles did Jesus, and manifested forth his glory. And his disciples believed on him. Now what do you mean by that? The miracles that Jesus performed while he was here were a manifestation of his glory, what he'd do for mankind, obedient mankind, in his kingdom. Now think of any need that man would have that Jesus didn't supply in his miracles. All right, now we'll take a few. He healed all manner of disease. That was a wonderful thing. Well then, but we have bad weather we don't like, huh? Jesus was out in the Sea of Galilee and the devil whipped up a storm and tried to drown him. Jesus was awakened and he raised his hand to the way, peace, be still. And there was a great calm. Yes, he controls the weather. Well then, but hold on now, we have other troubles. How about our tax money? Well, that is a, tr a, good, a good problem for many people. Some of us never had enough to pay tax on, but others have. How are they going to get the tax? You hear about some of our great men earning a great fortune, failing to pay the tax, losing the fortune, then have to go to jail to pay tax on a fortune he lost. Well, Peter got himself in a little trouble with the tax collector. He said, yeah, we pay tax. Well, the Lord didn't tell him to say that. He didn't pay tax of that kind. They paid temple tax. Well, then when Peter told the Lord about it, he said, Peter, you're a fisherman. Said, yeah, well, get, get the old tackle out and put a bait on it, go down there right on the shore where the Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee and throw out your hook and in a little while a fish grabbed and pulled him in opened his mouth and lo there was a piece of gold you go and give that to the tax collector that's a miracle so you can't think of one human need that Jesus did not provide for in the miracles well how about the dead ah oh, we got all over with that now we discussed that in detail yes he raised the dead so then he's the king that will rule for a thousand years and he is the king that will offer mankind the things he lost he lost his fellowship with God a beautiful home in his life Jesus came to save that which was lost he gave up the riches of glory came to earth as an ordinary man lived in a small town then was persecuted maligned lied about finally hanging on a torture stake between two thieves. He did all that that he might buy back what Adam's children lost through Adam's disobedience. And he's going to reign for a thousand years over this earth 
to give people back that which was lost. And it will take a thousand years to accomplish it all. The first part of the thousand years will be devoted, as the Bible clearly shows, to reorganizing things, getting them started. The fact of the matter is, the Lord's working at it now. He has a new world society. He's training from his word, the Bible, through the magazine he has blessed the watchtower. Read there about family arrangements at home, business arrangements, community arrangements, learning, building up. After Armageddon is over, the new world is going to start at scratch with nothing to begin with. They're going to have a well-organized arrangement that will affect the whole world for the people over the whole world. In all lands are embracing this message now with the hope of recovering through Christ's kingdom what was lost through Adam's disobedience. So after this it goes along a while and things are in good shape, then the next thought will be for the sleeping ones. And the idea is held, whether it's right or not, of course we can guess a lot of things there, but you can't depend upon your guesses. The thought is that the last people that died and left friends here on earth will be likely the first ones to come back. And gradually they'll go back. Everyone will find someone waiting for them here that knew them to take care of them and instruct them concerning this new world and the importance of life under Christ's kingdom. So then do you think it's worthwhile saying, I stand for my God Jehovah and I dedicate myself to him? He never asks you to do anything that will do harm to you or rob you of your joy and peace. But he'll bring peace and joy and boundless blessings to those who come to him and dedicate themselves to do his will. The Lord doesn't ask us to do the impossible. No, he gives us his favor and his blessing. So then, those who come to Jehovah, not a matter of negative righteousness. He doesn't say, well, now I don't sin and I don't gamble, I don't run about and I'm not a wicked man. That wouldn't get you anywhere. The young man came to Jesus one time. Now, he knew. Jesus knew how to explain. If he was here today for us, we'd all be sitting there with our mouths open, leaning over to catch every word. If you tell us how we'd get light. This young man came and the master, and he said, Master, what must I do to get everlasting life? But what's the commandments say? There are ten of them there. You know what they are. You mustn't steal. You mustn't lie. You mustn't bear false witness. You mustn't do this nor that. But you must honor Almighty God. Well, the young man said, I've done all those things from my youth up. Well, you find a young man like that today, there's not a church on earth amongst the sects of false religions. They say, come on, young man, we'll take you right up to the front seat and let everybody see you. Tell them to give your testimony at every meeting. There's a sample, they'd say. There's a man that must please God. And then he said, what lack I yet? And Jesus said, one thing. Give all you have to the poor and be my disciple. And then he'd be really rich. The young man hung his head and went off, slouching away, very sad because he had great worldly possessions. Now how long did he hold them? It wouldn't take very much time until that young man might grow up to be an old man as dead. And perhaps some of his worthless offspring would throw away and waste all that he had accumulated, thinking it would bring life to him. Man by riches or wealth cannot deliver himself nor redeem his brother either. either. Comes through Christ the Lord. Then the command is from God's word, come to him. Become one of his followers. The instructions given here, and there's nothing difficult. It all brings peace and joy and gladness. And in the end, life eternal on this earth, as beautiful as Eden was, fellowship with God, fullness of life, and a beautiful home. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. We, I'm certain that every one of us here can say we're indeed happy and glad to have been here to take into our minds and hearts these great words of wisdom from Jehovah's Word of Truth, the Bible. Certainly, Mr. McMillan is well qualified to speak to us on this subject and many other subjects, for he has diligently studied God's Word, the Bible, for some 60 years. And we, too, have the same privileges and opportunities today to do the same thing, 
to read and study and take into our minds and hearts these wonderful blessings that Jehovah has in store for us. Many of the things we can't retain in our minds, but we have a fine booklet here entitled This Good News of the Kingdom. If you don't have a copy of this, feel free to accept one as you leave the Kingdom Hall. However, we'd like you to, to remain in the Kingdom Hall for another hour to study additional portion in God's Word, the Bible, with the Watchtower magazine. Next Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock, we'd like to have you come back again to hear the...